Okay, so um, maybe we could go over the uh, the questions uh, here briefly, so we can make sure we're on the same page with them. Your name will differ. Um, function of risk scanning. What's the job of risk scanning? Yeah, well. Good. Um, so, yesterday's risk is often today's problem. Risks have a way of being possibilities and then materializing, and coming about. Uh, and so, part of the job is to try to catch catch that as early as possible. Uh, a second need is there may be new types of risks that come about, right? Um, as as time passes, the nature of the risks experience. Uh, experience different. Uh, maybe you've changed technologies, maybe uh, you know, you're now doing this with an additional system, Oculus Quest in addition to Oculus Rift. Um, you know, maybe uh, now that someone's left the team, that risk disappears that they will have, have you know, that they'll, they'll leave. Um, it's, it's been Materialized, but it's come about. You don't have to worry that it will come about in the future. So, so that's exactly right. Risk scanning is the two components you emphasize: keeping your eye out for risks that you have previously identified that may be coming about, and secondly, looking for new types of risks. So very good. Um, okay. Uh, so, at a high level, define contingency planning, and mitigation, as far as the effect risk management, with a particular focus on how they differ. So, so what are the, what, what's the sort of crux of the difference between them? Yes, uh, Macy. Uh, so, you can see the, uh, the it happened, yeah. the do, and yeah. the mitigation is how we can it. That's right. So, so broadly speaking, and it's a bit of an overt simplification, but broadly speaking, um, contingency planning involves putting into place a plan of what you would do if it comes about, recognizing that the cost of enacting that plan is only required if it actually comes about, right? Um, by contrast, mitigation is a matter of investing now, like undertaking actions now other than just planning, um, that, will, that will do what well for mitigation? Those actions that we undertake now are investments to allow what to happen? Why do we undertake actions in mitigation? To is it? Yes. So a big thing is reducing the chance that it occurs, but it's not the only thing. What's the other thing too? We undertake actions to reduce the damage if it does come about. If it, despite our our efforts, um, does happen, um, that will do less damage. So there's. Uh, the net effect is to reduce risk exposure. What is risk exposure? I could have asked a question about that. What is risk exposure? Okay. Uh, it's going to be uh, the, the figure of some sort of how, how many risks you're opening the project up to, or that your project is open to. Okay, at a, at a broad level, that's pretty good. Um, really, though, it, it it, it can be defined, and it is defined by many as more precise than that. It's it's kind of the, um, the as it were, the expected impact of that risk. So it takes into account the probability of the risk coming about, but also the level of impact if it does. And it's often treated as kind of the product of those two. So if something is a, is highly probable, even if it's only a modest risk, it may be a serious risk exposure. By contrast, if it's you know, very low probability, but devastating, it could also be a serious risk exposure. And if it's high both, that's really bad. And a lot of things are low in that, in which case we don't tend to worry about them that much. So, um, so mitigation lowers risk exposure. It does it in one of two ways. Lowering the probability of it occurring, or lowering the impact if it does occur, or both. So that's, that's what mitigation does. It undertakes actions now to accomplish one of those things. Um, in contrast to contingency planning, which is really an exercise of 
being all prepared to undertake actions if the risk materializes, uh, to coordinate effectively so we're all on the same page if this risk comes about. Okay. Um, case in point, uh, I had a colleague some years ago who had run a project which involved commissioning, well, building uh, engineering, designing, building, so constructing, and deploying a uh, $6 billion oil rig for stat oil in the North Sea. Um, this was out of Norway. Um, and uh, this is a, a major, as you can guess from the price tag, this is $6 billion US. Um, it was a major uh, you know, piece of equipment. And uh, there were risks associated with, with the engineering. A lot of the engineering was done overseas. And there were concerns that maybe something would be missed. So they actually dragged this thing out into a fjord in Norway um, to launch it. And things were going well until a leak suddenly started. A plate blew and the thing started to take on water. And it was sinking. A few years earlier, I think it was earlier uh, than this one, maybe it was a few years later, one of these actually uh, sunk. And apparently it caused a minor earthquake when it hit the floor at the fjord, like it was measured by seismic instruments across, I think, the world because it was, it was that you know, big a mass hitting the ocean floor. Um, but fortunately, this colleague of mine had engaged in a contingency plan. What if this happens? What if that happens? It's often different scenarios. So he had commissioned, in case it was needed, they'd be willing to pay. At the time, they had sort of in, um, you know, on reserve if they needed a set of helicopters which could deploy scuba divers to, to go in and, and try to work to plug in the leak. Now, don't ask me about the details of how, how the scuba divers work under those conditions. But, um, but that's what happened. So they had these helicopters which took off, flew, dropped in the scuba divers, and they plugged the leak, and it was saved, and it didn't cause an earthquake. You know, the sun was shining and the birds chirped and um, it was deployed at sea and uh, probably pumped out and, and things were happening. So putting in place contingency plans um, involves putting in place measures that you can, you have the option to undertake in the event that it occurs. And there's all science actually of what are called real options, which are things that I value because if they're needed, you can exercise it, but otherwise you don't need them. And there's a science to evaluating these sort of options, um, uh, which, uh, which has some interesting features about it. Um, okay, what does it mean for coverage testing level A to subsume another coverage testing level? So what, what does it mean for one to subsume the other? For example, for edge coverage to subsume no, no coverage. Yes, well. It contains all of the sort of test cases of the one underneath it and more. Yeah, yeah, so it's, that gives some of the, a good flavor of it. I mean, essentially achieving edge coverage automatically means you've achieved no, no coverage, is what that means. So it's, it subsumes in the sense that all of the tests that would occur for no coverage are guaranteed to be undertaken as well, Fred covered. Um, so how you put it was, was quite good. Um, so if we undertake the higher level um, that subsumes the lower level, we automatically gain the lower level of coverage through undertaking that higher level. Okay, so that's good. Um, Please indicate what is meant by an orthog using an orthogonal array to represent combinations of values for, for multiple, I said columns, um, it's multiple inputs often within a, a test case. Um, and specifically, um, what are the, the benefits of using orthogonal array? 
So it's orthogonal array, array, orthogonal array planning of this sort. Like, why do we use an orthogonal array? What, what are the benefits in for? Yeah, Yeah, it reduces the number of tests. Yeah. Good. So if we if we have you know a set of um, different inputs, maybe maybe five five inputs here. Um, and uh, each of them, I think maybe C, D, E, but imagine that fortuitously A actually indicates the number of possibilities as well. Maybe I'll say the size of the number of possibilities, but the cardinality. Okay. So A has maybe six possibilities, B has maybe two possibilities, C has three, you know, D has 20, and E has 15 or something like that. If we have that many possibilities for each, the number of the total possibilities of all, if we considered all possible combinations, would be what? Well, it would just be the multiplication of these. Um, is, is the number of po total possibilities. I mean, think about it. Imagine if these each had two possibilities. It would be almost as if you're considering all strings of you know, five, of, of length five bits, right? It was one or zero. You could have the first possibility of A or the second. You could have first possibility of B or the second one. The first possibility of C or the second one. So each of these is zero or one. And these are five bits. Each is zero or one. And so the total number of possibilities is two to the fifth, which is what? 32. I'm sorely tempted to break into a rendition of the first twenty number of powers of two, but I will spare you that. Um, but they're close to my heart, <laughs> and I hope they'll be close to yours. But there are generational divides. Um, okay, so so thirty-two different possibilities. That's two times two times two times two times. Two. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, uh, so, so in general, uh, this this can be prohibited. Now, you know, if if this if this is running all possible five, you know, five bit combinations, and all you're doing is running an algorithm that's really quick on them, that's not a problem. If these are different configurations, and the size of these sets are in the hundreds. It's a non-starter to try to manually configure it for each of those possibilities. And so we use an orthogonal array. And what does an orthogonal array give us? What's the fundamental guarantee that it gives us? Anyone? Yes. Yeah, it can give good judicious test coverage. Is it complete test coverage? No. But what does it guarantee? It doesn't guarantee that all possible combinations will be examined. That way would require the so-called full factorial design. You, multi you, you consider all possibilities. What does it give you, though? Will's hand uh, rises high. All pairs of Yes, it's all pairs. So, so what it gives us is all possibilities for A and B together, all possibilities of A and C together. We're guaranteed in the list of test cases to have for a given you can pick any A and you can pick any C, and it will be in there. Any A and any D will be in there. Any A and any E. Any B and any C. Any B and any D. Any B and any E. Uh, any C and any D. And any C and any E. And indeed, any D and any B. Any pair of combinations is guaranteed to be there. But, it's not guaranteed to be mixed and matched for that pair of combinations with all possible values of the others. That's how we avoid a blow up. And it turns out that this is often like orders and orders of magnitude smaller than all possible combinations. And often it's small enough that it, you know, if it's big, it's in the hundreds or something like that, or, or often it's in the dozens, which is not bad. 
And there's tools that will generate this for you. And it reflects the fact that often errors are, are shortcomings in compatibility that's pairwise. You can get funky things happening where, you know, it requires three very specific things to happen. But often when there's incompatibilities in life, whether it's between people or technologies or what have you, it's a pairwise thing. It's a pairwise thing. Um, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, the orthogonal arrays allow you to judiciously choose your test cases. You know, pick your battles carefully. Dwight Eisenhower. Do you folks know who Dwight Eisenhower is? Sorry? He was a president of the U.S., that's true. But before he was a president, what did he... What was he, what was his call to fame? General? Yeah, he was, he was perhaps the most famous general uh, for, for essentially on the Allied side for World War II. He's not the only one, there's, there's some others, Omar Bradley and so on, but he was, he was perhaps the most famous in terms of being a successful general on the Allied side. And someone asked once, asked, once asked him, how did you, you know, how did you win so many battles so successfully in World War II? And what he said, mark my words, this is an important lesson, mark my words. He said, the most successful battles that I won, the, the, the battles that were most important were those that I didn't fight, that I avoided fighting. I chose my battles carefully that I would fight. That's what he said. And, Ladies and gentlemen, much of life benefits from, from choosing your battles very carefully. Which battles are worth, worth fighting? As they say, which is a hill that, on which you're willing to die and which is not? And, and it turns out that, that orthogonal arrays allow us to pick our battles carefully. They allow us to pick test cases that are more likely to show problems because they're the problems that either occur for a very specific value, say of A, or a very specific value of E or whatever, or that occur for pairs because it's a compatibility issue that, you know, um, your system doesn't work with when Firefox is used on Macs or something like that, and it always fails for that. Um, uh, anyway, um, so that's, that's a pairwise thing. Um, okay. So, so that was that, uh, that question. Um, three benefits that peer reviews bring to a product. Oh, one straightforward. What, what do you get out of a peer review? Well, one thing you get out of a peer review is that allows it to compete with, and I use those in scare quotes, with testing as well. You find you find faults, and Camille sp speaks once again well. Because you notice she didn't say, you find failures. Testing identifies the failure. Testing says, oh, this crashes when we, when we run this test case, or you know, uh, it does a core dump when this happens, or it hangs, or you know, it shows this wrong result. That's a failure, but to turn that into a fix, what do you have to do? You have to go through what? It begins with the D. It has two G's in it. There's a B as well. <laughs> and there's a G at the end. Oh, sorry. Yes. So three G's in it. Okay. okay. Um, it's called debugging, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I trust at this point in the course you're not unfamiliar with that. Um, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, peer review finds faults. It cuts to the chase and often allows you to identify defects directly. And that cuts out time for bugging, for writing and rewriting and reconfiguring tests, and often identifies the fault. What another thing that it gives a problem? Yes, speak. Yeah, 
it, yeah, it spreads knowledge about the system. It spreads knowledge about how it works. If you have five people together and they're reviewing, you know, this um, this particular uh, set of snapshot tests for Jest, people learn how snapshot testing is performed in Jest. I mean, they start to understand, uh, oh, that's how you configure a test, or this is how you how you might test this other thing, et cetera. This is how you run the tests, et cetera. So that's, that's really good. It, it helps you understand the system and the technology it's used for. What else does it help, um, so it spreads that knowledge. What, is it, what other things does it help spread knowledge about? Stylistic things also, or like, how do we document tests? Uh, what, uh, what's our standard for indenting um, or for commenting code? Right? Um, what's our standard for specifications, for specifying preconditions and posting? It, it spreads understanding of conventions within the team. Those are all key features of, of peer review. Now, there's a, there's a very important aspect of peer review. It's one of my favorite tasks about on exams. Yeah, prep those pens. Um, Sam is poised, um, and with good, not without reason. Um, it's another really good thing about peer review. It's easy to compare it with testing, and contrast it with fun, false, directly, and so on. Spreading knowledge is another key thing, but what's, what's another thing it does? Yeah, Sam. Yes. That's right, you're, you're gonna go before a council of your peers. Not to be re reviewed yourself, the attention should be on the technical artifact. But you know that when you write that code, you're not gonna be the only one browsing it in the future. Others are gonna look at that. And that helps you just be a little bit more careful often to, to dot, your, dot your eyes across. That's really good, and it's important. It has to do with moral suasion, a sense of shame, having a sense of shame. I think Sam appreciates good English. Um, so um, it, 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 it sort of harnesses our sense of wanting to, <coughs> wanting to be able to look our, our colleagues in the eye, and pass, pass the red face test if someone looks at our code. Another element that I'll just mention before going on, it won't be exhaustive, but another one is we can peer review things that are not code. We can peer review things where we can't write tests because there's, there ain't no code there. Give me, give me a couple things that we can peer review that, that really writing tests for is not feasible. Uh, yes, Matt. Yeah, the John government. Good. Uh, like overall like algorithmic or coding style. Yeah, yeah, so coding style and sort of maybe maybe um, sort of uh, if the tightness of code or efficiency of the code or aspects of the algorithm people may identify, you know, better data structures to use for it. I'm not gonna reveal that with uh, with with tests. Uh, what what are other things? Can, uh, reveal. Yeah. Uh, maybe like a presentation for a stakeholder. James? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, presentations for stakeholders. Good. Yeah. I see. Sorry? Yeah. Um, yeah, so so etiquette for doing pull requests in Git or something like that. That's good. That's that's good. Um, uh, test plans um, are another thing. Uh, requirement stocks. They argued that, you know, the, the cost of not finding a, a, a problem, um, you know, early is, is great. That if you look at, you know, time until a problem is found, uh, and you consider from its inception to when it's found, um, maybe it's problem that originates uh, you know, at, 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 at different stages. Um, maybe I'm, th there is 
There is some truth to what I'm saying, but I'm actually going to put a different axis. I'm sorry. So um, stage, this will be stage of problem origination, OK? So does the problem originate in the requirements or in the design or in the, you know, the coding or in the, the test? And, and if it originates in requirements, often the, the net cost of that, if it's found late, this will be, if, if it's found late, would be huge compared to if it originated in design versus coding, et cetera. That's, that's a different graph we could create. There's also the graph which I've shown rise exponentially in terms of sort of uh, how long is it until it's found, uh, if it originates, say, in, in requirements space? If you find it early, it will it'll be much cheaper. As time goes on, more and more things will be built around it, right? There'll be design built around it. There'll be code built around it. There'll be tests built around it. Um, there'll be documentation built around it. There'll be help systems built around it. There'll be localization built around it. And those things will have to be thrown away if you only identify it later. Some of them will have to be redone. Um, so finding things early through, uh, through peer review is really valuable. Um, OK, uh, give the names of three types of peer review that, that, that depend on different levels of formality. So we've talked about a wide variety of types of peer review. And in your team projects, you have made use of different types of peer review. Give me three examples that have, you know, rather different levels of formality associated with them. Yeah. Well, desk check. Sorry? Desk yeah, desk check. You're saying, hey, can you take a look at this? Maybe it's, uh, you know, someone across the room, or you, you pass it to them to, to take a look over, um, you know, soon, et cetera. Okay, so good. So peer desk track, yeah. How about other things? Yeah. Yeah, formal inspection, good. What about another type of peer review? James, yeah. Uh, requiring uh, another group member to uh, look over into the mutual desk. Okay, yeah. So, so that can be a, a little bit more formal in the sense you circulate it to them uh, ahead of time, you have to, um, and they have some time to look at it. So it can be a little bit more formal than a peer desk check, maybe. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll count that as a different model. But there's a very common one you folks have been undertaking. Yeah, well, peer programming counts. Yeah, it's a type of peer review. Um, you know, you have someone looking over your shoulder, and you're, you're undertaking it, and you're talking back and forth. Maybe it's buddy testing, or maybe it's uh, pair testing. Uh, or, you know, so you're, you're, you're banging on the system next to each other, et cetera. These are all types of peer review, and they differ considerably. Okay? Um, so these are uh, important, uh, important features here. Um, OK, four distinct ways in which we can improve the testability of a project. Anyone? Yeah, well. Assertions. Uh, good, yeah. So assertions improve testability in the sense that um, they can help a given test go further by allowing it to identify problems, things that are off base internally to the system as soon as possible. So a test that might have seemed to pass, like, oh, the login occurred, right? Um, and then you can log out. Maybe behind the scenes it's screwed up and an assertion might find that. It might like find something's off, something's inconsistent, and clue you into it. So an assertion is a great example uh, of something that it can enhance testability. Other things? Yeah, Matt? Uh, very testable code, like user scratch, and make it easily mockable. Uh, easily mockable, yeah. yeah, exactly. So you have a separation of concerns. You have a barrier between the implementation and the interface so that people can substitute in a different implementation for the same interface, or you can otherwise tell it to mock it out. and. And that allows you to substitute in a sort of fake a doppelganger for it, something that's uh, you know sort of a fake version of that. 
can allow it to be tested. So that's really good. Or, or it can allow a simplified version of it to put it in manually, a mock, uh, or fake, which will, uh, will function uh, there. So that can enhance testability. Excellent. So others? Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, test hooks? Yeah, test hooks. Um, kind of have a way of peering inside or spying on what's going on within the system. That's, that's uh, excellent. Um, test matrix. OK, so, so uh, what are the axes in test matrix? I'm not looking for a definitive thing, but basically one of the axes one axis can vary actually quite a bit for different test matrices. But the other, maybe I'll call it, without loss of generality, I'll call it the x-axis, the horizontal axis. Um, this is a very specific thing. So test matrices essentially always have certain thing along one of the two axes. And what is that now? Test cases? Yeah, the test cases. So test case one, two, however you want to specify. Um, and the other dimension will commonly be, give me some examples. Um, yes, the other man. Oh, oh, no, it's the same man. OK. Features. Yes, so features is good. Yeah, other things? Other, other could be, yeah, well. Requirements or use cases? Yeah, requirements, use cases, functionality. You know, maybe it's uh, some aspect of. Uh, a non functional you know, things like uh, uh, you know, performance-related uh, components, et cetera, security, or what have you, and uh, possibly those could be evaluated by the test. And well, how does this help us? Okay, so we put our tests in there. Yeah, yeah. Identify the test that you're supposed to identify if the feature has testing at all. Well spoken. Yeah, so if this, if this column is empty, what does that test really, what's its job in life? Sometimes tests have jobs that are clear early, but you know things change. Functionality changes. Features evolve, folded into other things. Features are removed because you have a much better way to do it now through UI actions or whatever, rather than through a menu. And sometimes test cases, they, they no longer have a clear purpose in life, right? Okay, so that's one thing. And another thing is you might have some functionality that's not tested by any test. And that could be a gap of a different sort. Maybe you've got to create a test that will test this thing out. So it can, you know, it's a tool that, it's a model that allows you to sort of reflect on where are our testing gaps, right? And to reason about where this test go, uh, you know, where tests need to be put into place. It can also help you know, someone who's maneuvering within the test system, reason about big picture, you know, what are the different jobs of the tests in the system? That's also important, okay? Um, to be able to understand where do different, different tests fit in. Um, so even if there's poor documentation elsewhere in a given test, maybe you can figure out its job is to test this certain requirement. Another thing is you achieve some traceability with this. Maybe you can comment, like why, why, why do I say trusted traceability? What, what might I have in mind here? Yeah, well, amazing. So if it goes back to the showing of use cases from the requirements that you can see that these cases are derived from the requirements that Yeah, um, that's right. So it can. You want to make sure there's this link here so that if, uh, if new, new use cases uh, come about and requirements that they get reflected here, make sure they're, they're uh, consistent. Or if a given use case changes or a feature requirement changes, you'd like to be able to know, you know what tests might need to be modified, right? If there's a use case or a requirement that's been materially altered, and there's some tests that their job is to validate that, you, you might really want to think about modifying those tests, checking them out and see, okay, are they broken now because of this change? You know, we've turned, 
we've turned this menu item into a UI action. There's no menu item for it anymore. Um, or uh, we've ended support for this earlier version of Edge or what have you. Um, uh, maybe these test cases need to be deprecated or, or, or you know, uh, no, longer, um, no longer serve a purpose. So, so it can be very useful to sort of reason about the effects of change. Um, and similarly, if a test case is eliminated, it might give you a sense of, okay, do we still have some test for certain features? So it helps you, traceability allows you to reason about how the effects of change ripple through your, your artifacts, your project, your sort of pieces of your, your process, including test cases, including certain requirements, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so that's good. Any, any uh, questions people might have about the, um, the answers to these? Okay, and hopefully that is a good reminder of, of some of the features um, of this class that we covered before the break.